so everybody can see that. And we're just going to dive straight into World War II and the Texas home front, all right? So where we last left off last week in our great story of Texas and its 20th century transformation was the Depression and the New Deal and the whole experience of the 1930s as things collapsed around Texans every which way that was imaginable. And then the New Deal comes in as this jobs program, essentially, from the federal government that helps rebuild aspects of Texas, gives a lot of Texans jobs, um, brings electricity to rural Texans, and was remarkably popular amongst the average Texan for most of the 1930s. As we talked about at the end of the last class, there was a last class, last session, sorry. Um, there was a conservative backlash during the second half of the 1930s, as some people were increasingly worried about how far FDR was going and how far the New Deal programs were going. But as a general rule, uh, it was a very popular thing. And then World War II hits, and that's where we left off last, time, all right? So our guiding question for this first section is, is about how and why Texans threw themselves into the fight during World War II and, and this is the big part, why did that matter? The Texans are going to throw themselves in, as we're going to see. They're going to resist it at first for a short while. But they're going to throw themselves in in huge ways. And that's going to matter because it's going to be a part of transforming Texas from a rural state to an urban state. That's one of the biggest transformations that happens throughout this entire period, all right? So let's go see how that happens. Now, the story of World War II really begins uh, during the 1930s, all right? Because that's the period when uh, this guy you probably have heard of, Adolf Hitler, rises to power in Germany and he becomes chancellor of Germany in 1933, which is the same year that uh, unemployment reaches 25% in the United States. And I think that's a good moment to think about this is that throughout most of the 1930s, when Hitler's rising to power, Americans, which means Texans, are aware of what's going on most of them don't care <laughs> what's happening in Europe. It's not because they're heartless. It's because they've got a depression that they're dealing with and they don't have jobs. They don't have ability to feed their families in some cases, or they're working New Deal programs in the late 1930s. Basically things are, are, are fairly busy back home. And so when Germany unleashes its war mission in 1939, invading Poland, you can see right here, this is just everything, all these arrows coming out of Germany going every which direction. You know, Germany literally unleashes a blitzkrieg uh, across Europe. They take over Poland, they take over France, they go up to Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and basically take over much of the European continent. When that happens, you know, there's it's all over the news. It's not like people in the United States, people in Texas weren't aware of all of that. But for the average Texan, they there wasn't a strong reaction of we've got to get involved. A lot of people in Texas, actually most people in Texas, but like these guys here who were struggling with the depression still by the late 1930s, were trying to feed themselves and their families. And as far as they were concerned, that's probably Europe's problem. Or if they're watching the Pacific where the Japanese have uh, invaded Manchuria, um, that's another problem, not necessarily our problem, right? So there was an early resistance uh, to getting involved in the war. That all changed, of course, on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese uh, attack at Pearl Harbor. It's uh, obviously a, a horrific attack on the American Navy and the American mainland. Uh, well, not the mainland, but uh, American territory in, in the form of Hawaii. And this galvanizes the entire United States. So for those of us who remember 9-11, of course, it was a similar sort of experience of being under attack and this sense of, of the moral righteousness of defending ourselves. And so we immediately declare war on Japan. All right? This is FDR in one of his most famous speeches saying that you know, December 7th, 1941 would be a day that lived in infamy. infamy. And I always like to point out, it was actually a Texan, uh, Senator Tom Connolly, that introduced the war resolution that brought the United States into World War II. And we declare war on Japan. Japan then, of course, declares war on us. And then Germany declares war on us, and we declare war on Germany. And so as of December 1941, the United States is now in full bore, full measure into World War II. And so Texans 
like Americans writ large, but more than anywhere else, Texans line up to join the military, right? So you can see this is a, a, a line of, you can see very young men. These guys look like kids to me. You know, these guys are probably 17, 18, 19 years old. Um, these guys are in Houston. They're all lined up to join the United States military. And this is going to be important because the United States at this time did not have what we do now, which is the most powerful military in the world. We had to build that during World War II. And so it's World War II that will create this massive uh, military that the United States has maintained during the Cold War and up through the present day. And these guys are volunteering for that in the wake of, of Pearl Harbor. Right? And there's a lot of people that are going to volunteer for uh, the military from Texas during World War II. Number. 750,000 Texans, three quarters of a million, are going to serve in the armed forces during World War II. That's a lot of people. It's not all men. It's mostly men, but it's not exclusively men. About 23,000 Texans who will give their lives during World War II. One of the things I always point out to my students is that uh, Texas actually put in more people per capita than any other state in the United States during 1942. The first full year that we are in the war, the War Department announced that Texas produced more soldiers per, uh, man for man and person for person than any other state in the United States. And there's going to be 36 Texans that win Congressional Medals of Honor. Um, my favorite statistic that gives you a sense of just how many Texans served in the war what an important impact that had is to talk about uh, my alma mater, Texas A&M University, which is, of course, College Station, where Michelle is. And Texas A&M, if you guys know, I'm sure most of you do, has uh, an ROTC program on steroids called the Corps of Cadets. And the Corps of Cadets uh, produced 15, no, sorry, 14,000 officers for the United States military during World War II. So a and produced 14,000 officers during World War II. And to put that into context for you guys, that is more than West Point and the Naval Academy produced during World War II combined, All right? So Texans serve in massive numbers. And I love talking about this era because it's got this incredible art of recruitment posters and things like that, that, you know, are, they're propaganda in a certain sense, but they're trying to recruit people. I once had a, a TA for a class I was teaching who he had been uh, in the Navy before he went to graduate school. And he actually served in submarines. And I, I had this poster up on the PowerPoint. And he took one look at that. And he said, he just takes me aside. He goes, that, that's not what submarines are like, not even a little bit. I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but anyway, um, there's a lot of Texans who serve. I, we don't have time here to talk about them in detail, which is pretty unfortunate because there's some amazing stories. Um, I'm just going to give you guys the bare bones of three Texans that I use as stand-ins as great stories that if you're looking for stories to bring into your classroom, if you don't already talk about these gentlemen, um, they're very powerful. The first is this gentleman here. His name is Dory Miller. His, his actual given name was Doris, but he went by Dory. And... Uh, he was an African-American young man from Waco, Texas, which if you grew up in you know, 1930s, 1940s Texas, this is a, a bit, the height of Jim Crow and no opportunities for African-American men or women. And so he ended up joining the Navy um, and before World War II and became a cook because you could be in the Navy if you were African-American, but you could not have a fighting role. And so he was in what they call the service corps, essentially. Um, and he's sent to Hawaii. He's at Pearl Harbor. And he's there on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese Zeros come in and start torpedoing everything they can. And when that happens, his ship is hit. He runs up to the main deck. And this is a famous story, but he gets up there and there's an anti-aircraft um, guns up on the deck that no one is, is manning and no one's firing at zero. So he has no training because being a black man, he's not allowed to be in a fighting position with the Navy, but he goes ahead and jumps into that, that, uh, that anti-aircraft gun and starts firing. And he, 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 he fires at the zeros until the ship goes down, quite literally. He's later given uh, the Naval Cross, which is one of the highest honors the Navy has. And he's promoted to cook third class because that's as high as he could go. Um, and so Dory Miller, he'll later 
die in the uh, Pacific when his uh, ship is sunk by a Japanese submarine, but he's a, he's a naval hero during World War II from Texas. Um, another quick story is this gentleman here, Macario Garcia, um, who was a Mexican immigrant to Texas when World War II broke out. He was in Sugar Land at the time. Um, he volunteered for the United States military because you could serve, you didn't have to be a citizen. And he served he, in Europe. He was a part of the post D-Day invasion that was heading through France and heading towards Germany. And he distinguished himself in combat so amazingly. Um, there's a long story we don't have time for. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. So that's Harry Truman himself putting the Congressional Medal of Honor on Macario Garcia. And not long after this picture was taken, Macario Garcia was back in Houston on some R and R, and he wanted to eat in a restaurant that wouldn't serve him because he was Mexican, which he took offense to that and and got into a fight over it. And Macario Garcia ended up becoming a U.S. citizen in 1947, but it's a good example of people of Mexican ancestry fighting for the United States during World War II, coming from Texas. The most decorated soldier of the war was a Texan, Audie Murphy, right here. And there's a long story I could tell about Audie Murphy. We do not have time. Um, short version is he's lived the whole story we've told in this, in this sessions over this time. He grew up dirt poor. He was a sharecropper, his family was sharecroppers in Hunt County. And he had no education to speak of. He had no opportunities to speak of. His father ran away when he was 10. His mother died when he was 15. And so at 15 years old during the depression, he's in charge of his brothers and sisters and trying to feed all of them and ends up putting some of them in orphanages to make sure they have enough food to eat. So when World War II breaks out, he enlists um, because he needs the opportunity as much as anything else. And he gains weight during the war because he gets three square meals a day. He ends up distinguishing himself like almost nobody during World War II. He wins 33 medals. The United States runs out of medals to give this guy. Later, France and Belgium are also giving him medals. I don't have time to go into some of the war stories, but at one point he held off an entire German regiment all by himself for an entire hour, killing 50 Germans single-handedly. So they gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor for that one. Um, he's an amazing figure, but all these guys I think are stand-ins for us to recognize that there's a massive number of Texans, men and women, uh, who served in uniform during World War II and made incredible sacrifices that are stories that we need to understand and that we need to tell. Um, but what I want to talk mostly about is the home front and the transformations that happened there in Texas, because I think our students quickly understand why battles matter, but why the home front matter is another thing that I think they need to grasp, because that's, again, where transformation really happens in Texas during World War II. And so after Pearl Harbor, there's actually a lot of panic in Texas because there's fears that Texas will be bombed by Japanese zeros, um, that U-boats that from German U-boats might come into the Gulf of Mexico, which in fact does happen. And so they have blackout drills along the coast, places like Galveston and Houston. Um, and they're, they're worried about invasions in part because that happened in Pearl Harbor and we have a coastline and we had a lot of valuable resources as we're going to talk about. None of that ended up coming to Texas, and they ease off a lot of this blackout talk and things like that. But sacrifice, if you're taking notes, I'd write the word sacrifice down. Sacrifice happened in Texas for everybody who was back home, even if you weren't serving on the front lines, because there was rationing, all right? There were things that you were giving up on a regular basis. So in the chat, guys, I want you to answer this question for me. What do you think was the first thing rationed by the United States, all right? during World War II. Just throw it in there real fast. I wanna see what you guys have. Sugar says Kathleen, sugar says Carol. Oil, nylon, rubber, rubber, chrome or brass, I like that. Sugar, meats, tires, that'd be rubber as well. Yeah, cause there's not aluminum, oil, oil and gas, silk, bullets. <laughs> Try getting Texans to ration bullets. Let's see if that one works. Um, butter, wood. I love it all. Yes, fantastic. All those things, almost all those things got rationed, right? The ones that you guys guessed, food is the first thing, all right? And sugar specifically is what got rationed first, quickly followed by coffee, 
quickly followed by all kinds of things because they needed to feed the soldiers in the field. And they were worried about having enough supplies as they're trying to build up this massive war machine and ship it, uh, in this case, across the Atlantic. And then soon after that, will be to the Pacific as well. So here, I love these posters. They worked so well in the classroom. Right, students really react to these things, and they're colorful and interesting, and they, that's they're supposed to be right. They draw your eyes, right? But this guy over here, who seems to be having the best cup of coffee ever, right, is like, please don't take more coffee than you need, because I'm on the front lines getting shot at. I would use, I could use some of that. And this lady on the right says, "Of course I can. I'm patriotic as can be, and ration points won't worry me." Right. So when food was rationed. And there's lots of ways that this was done. So these are stamps that were being used um, to decide who had what in terms of access to types of food, how much you would get, how much sugar, how much coffee, later how much meat, things like that. Um, it was an evolving system. And eventually the newspapers were printing basically these tables like this that said if you had certain stamps like A, B, or C stamps, and certain number of points that those allowed you to have, and it's Tuesday, and you've got these ingredients that what you could buy and not buy. And what's interesting about that is it meant that everybody, every day, had to think about the war effort and how their consumption might or might not be affecting it, right? So you're making sacrifices at home. Maybe you don't have as much sugar and you don't have as much coffee, you don't have as much whatever it is, eggs, butter. And so you've got to think about what you're going to do and the sacrifices that that might entail, right, with um, men, in some cases women, fighting on the front lines. And it meant people were connected to the war effort, all right? People were also encouraged to grow their own food. Now that we've got to ship food overseas and people are encouraged to start growing what they're called victory gardens in people's backyards where you'd go plant whatever um, that you might eat on your own. And Americans, Texans did this on a large scale. 20% um, of our food by the end of the war is being produced in these little backyard gardens that people are growing all over the place. So after food, what was the next thing to be rationed? All right, well, a lot of you guys already guessed this. It was gasoline and, and oil and petroleum products generally, right? I love using this poster. My students always get a laugh out of this one because, I mean, nobody wants to carpool with Hitler, right? Um, but, you know, petroleum products were very important, very valuable for the war machine, for moving the war machine, for all of those sorts of things. And so very soon in the early part of the war, they start rationing gas, rationing petroleum of some sorts, and there was a national speed limit set. And I always have my students guess, like, what do you think they set the national speed limit at? It was 35 miles an hour. Think about that. Can you imagine driving 35 miles an hour from Houston to Dallas or vice versa? 35 miles an hour. Well, most Texans couldn't stand that idea. This is the one part of all of this that, that Texans tended to uh, resist, right? So here's a great, I just pulled this uh, yesterday from the Denton Record Chronicle, because I'm in Denton, Texas, so I thought it'd be cool to pull from that. This is an article talking about Texans getting riled up about rationing of gasoline. And you can see in the end of the first paragraph right here, it talks about our Senator Tom Connolly said that Texans would give up only grudging submission to the order. But they're actually, they'll do it, but they're, they're not gonna want to do it. So, but the reason this matters, Texans fall in line when it came to rationing gas. Um, but it meant that once again, you were constantly reminded of the war and that you were being asked to make sacrifices at home on behalf of the soldiers on the front. So you constantly felt connected, whether you wanted to or not, with that larger war effort. And as a result, um, people were deeply, increasingly invested in the war as, as it went on over time. People also had scrap metal drives in various towns to get you know, raw supplies for making tanks and ships and planes and machine guns and everything else in between. And so you have these drives like this in Texas towns and cities across across the state. Um, in Elgin, Texas, they just took apart a massive bridge and used all that, sacrificed it to be able to, to help build this massive war machine. And there was a lot of um, cartoons and, you know, propaganda. I don't mean that necessarily in a negative sense, but, um, 
things like this that was drawn by, this is drawn by Theodor Giesel, better known as Dr. Seuss, right? Talking about material conservation, which is to say rationing, but also recycling materials for building machines um, will help us win the war. And you can see a very racialized, exaggerated um, caricature of, of Japanese people uh, as a part of this, of this, this war effort. At the same time too, if you had any money left over, which you know, in 1941, not many Texans did because we're at the end of the Great Depression. We don't know it's the end yet. You were also encouraged to buy war bonds, right? And so I love this, this image right here. Of, don't let that shadow touch them because it's a Nazi. Um, it's a Nazi emblem that's, that's in the background there, but buy war bonds because we need the money to build this war machine, right? And about half of the war effort was financed through war bonds. And the other half was financed through uh, a new income tax that was, that was passed in 1942 and 1943. But once again, my point is there were sacrifices asked of Texans kind of at all aspects of their lives, whether it was food, whether it was getting around in their cars, or it was in this case being taxed or being asked to whatever put whatever money you do have into war bonds to help finance the war machine, but it touched every aspect of the lives of everyday Texans. And as a result, Texans felt deeply invested in the war, deeply connected to the war. You might've had a brother, son, father who's out there fighting, but even if you don't, you are connected to those soldiers in these everyday kind of ways. And it means that for World War II, um, there's not a lot, there's division, there is, divisiveness in some levels, but it's a much more uniform sense amongst most Texans that we're on the right side and we're fighting the good fight than we've had in almost any other war in American history. And so between all of that, um, Texans invest themselves deeply in the war and they then start doing jobs for the United States government in support of that. And when that happens, will increase urbanization and really remake the landscape of Texas in ways that you and I are going to recognize today. So with that, I'm going to pause. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a second, and I'm going to hand the mic over to my friend and colleague, Jay Ferguson, who's going to walk you guys through some resources. All right. Let me share my screen. Hope everybody's doing well on the holiday today. And then you enjoyed your PD at school. Um, so what I've done is uh, brought together a handful of resources. That I think you can you, you don't need to uh, spend a lot of time just treating this as one overall lesson, uh, but you can incorporate these into your existing lessons. And one of those activities is I pull from the president's um, four essential freedoms, human freedoms, um, and create, once it loads, sorry about that, let me close some stuff, that allows you to um, interact with the four basic freedoms of uh, speech, uh, worship, freedom from um, want or fear, and um, it really, we've seen, all of us have seen these, um, and I even, when I did the research on this, didn't know a lot of the background behind these, but um, I thought it'd be kind of neat because I feel like the kids can come up with some general ideas, but I feel like the, the Thanksgiving one um, is a big one, which truly I asked that question at the back end, which one of these does still in use today? And I think we typically see that the most. Um, so I, that is a, a really quick hook exercise. And then um, I've created... I, I'm keen about the propaganda piece. I feel like the kids like it as well, too. Um, this particular lesson is designed to keep them interested in it. So I do talk about what propaganda is, how it was used during the, as a war effort. I talk about two methods, uh, bandwagon and then loaded words. Um, and then I also bring into, into the equation the colors associated with uh, propaganda and give them somewhat of a color chart um, that they can use to... Um, go through and analyze propaganda pieces. And it's a basic set of questions. There's 10, 10 pieces of propaganda that um, I want the students to look at. But what we're really looking at is, you know, what type of method are they using? Uh, what are the primary colors of poster? 
Uh, what kind of emotion is it? So we kind of get involved with, you know, just not looking at it, but really analyzing the, the actual propaganda piece. And there's some, some um, negative connotations behind it, but there's also a little bit of from the German perspective of the gloriousness of it. And this stimulates a lot of conversation and you can open this up to even more conversation and even more questions. Um, my actual version that I, that I like of this has uh, at least um, 20 questions, but and I don't analyze as many of these images um, as I provided. We have some Japanese perspective. And then we kind of get into, I do give a little background information about Rosie the Riveter piece. Uh, bring Dory uh, Miller into the equation as well, too, much like Dr. Torgut mentioned today. Um, but just kind of really get through some of the basic um, stimulants to drive um, the American population, German population, even the Japanese population. Uh, but the, the intent is to generate conversations, generate um, um, classroom or group conversations. I've done something similar to this in small groups. I've done a gallery walk where I've taken just a worksheet and then I have the uh, propaganda posters in a pretty good size, not the normal size, but to have them walk around as a gallery and, and students um, really seem to, to enjoy working with, with that activity. And then I have another activity. I've discovered this woman. Um, her name is Cornelia Fort. Um, I wanted to bring a, a new voice into the equation. And this is a woman's perspective, not so much uh, of the war, but th she was actually given a flight. She's a flight instructor in, you know, in Hawaii. and was given a instruction the morning of the attack. And I've this is not a full-blown lesson. This is very short and sweet, but I, just, I didn't really have a really good spot to put it into it. But she literally tells the story of what was going on that morning um, and how a zero just buzzes her, almost knocks, you know, shakes her out of the sky. She, I, I love the, the, where they start to see um, the bombing happening in there. And she narrowly escapes with her, um, her life as well as her student's life associated with that. So this is a, a little bit different perspective of uh, Pearl Harbor attack. And then the last one I want to bring in is a Mercurio Garcia um, was able to find the, um, the comic book. There's actually a comic book produced, a uh, Medal of Honor comic book. And I apologize for the, the lag on the, on the delay on this. And this is just a basic seven questions um, analysis of this to where you could read it as a group or you could um, allow students to work with this interactive. I like to use graphic novels as much as I can. I, 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 I use about three different graphic novels in various lessons. And this is one, it's very short, sweet. It's literally just two pages. And it basically tells his story of what he did to um, win the Medal of Honor, the valor that he that he had, and there's there's other backup information where you can actually come back and, as Dr. Torgut mentioned, um, the racism that he faces when he gets back home. Um, but it's, it's, this is a fun little activity that um, I plan to use. I I just discovered it this year, and this is fun that, that I want to bring into it because I want I want to see my students' responses. I mean, I know everybody you know knows comic books, but most of the kids are reading graphic novels. They're not reading comic books. Um, and then the links I've kind of stationed a, a, quite a few different things um, that you could possibly look at. World War II by the numbers. I don't know if you've ever used that, that site. This literally tells the world, world war by the numbers, um, by, by nations, by individuals. Um, it's about 18 minutes long. I end my unit with this particular presentation and the students all go, wow. Um, it really grips them from that. Let's have some more information about Marquirio Garcia. Um, women in World War II. Um, I could go so deep with this, and that was the problem. Michelle and I were talking is I could spend so much time with other things that I have that I wanted to do that I started, and I'm actually going to continue a lot of them that I, that I worked on, um, but World War II is such a big picture, a big topic as a whole, so I just want to kind of give you these pieces. Um, these are some of them I've used, um, especially the propaganda. The kids do, they interact with that very well, but I just want to kind of share some some new things for you, um, as well as, um, and you'll be excited when Michelle does hers because she's got a really cool one that um, I will I will definitely incorporate into my lesson plan. So with with all that, I am done with my World War piece of it, and I will turn it over to Dr. Torgan. 
right. Thank you, Jay. I love that comic. I had no idea that existed. And now I'm, well, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't, I haven't finished. I haven't gotten through that part yet in my own class. So I'm going to be using, I'm going to be using that. Somebody was asking Jay, if you have a link, I know it's linked directly in the, um, in the uh, lesson plan, but if you could slap that into the chat, I think people are asking about that. That'd be fantastic. All right. So let me uh, go back to share my screen and we can pick our story back up. All right. So, so we left, off, um, we were talking about the home front and the sacrifices right, that people were making. But the reason that Texas is transformed during the war is because of the military investments. So again, if you guys are taking notes, all right, I, I, I always tell my students this, like write down, like the United States military invests heavily in Texas, all right? So this gets to our central questions for this one. You know, how did the Texans on the home front contribute to the war effort? And why was Texas so critical? Because it was, in a big way, to the United States military, right? And so the first place to start with this, when I'm talking about World War II in Texas, I, I emphasize as much as I possibly can that Texas became one of the biggest, if not the biggest training ground, military training ground in the world during World War II, right? One and a half, almost one and a half million men and women in the armed services trained in Texas during World War II because the United States military decided this was a great place to train people, right? We're not so far north that we get a lot of snow, all right? We are pretty hot in the summer. There's no doubting that. But we're not on the equator either, all right? We're not like a Florida Everglades, necessarily. Um, we have a coastline, so we can do a whole lot of stuff in terms of the Navy. We have West Texas. We've got open plains regions. We've got the, the Eastern Piney Woods. We're connected to everything. And we're also halfway between the East Coast and the West Coast. So we're very centrally located. And so you, if anyone's ever you know, spent a lot of time with me, you know one of my favorite refrains is geography matters. Well, it matters a lot right now when it comes to World War II in Texas, because Texas is turned into a massive training ground by the United States military, right? So you can see here on the on the bottom here, I had some numbers, so I wanted to write these down for you guys. But the Army and Navy, you can see, builds 44, air, 44 bases in Texas. And then the U.S. Army Air Corps, which is a precursor to the Air Force, will build 65 airfields. All right, 44 bases and 65 airfields. I am not good at math. But I can do this math. It's 109 bases that are built all over Texas during World War II. 109 bases. That's an absolutely massive investment. And the reason that's so key is because what does that mean? That means jobs, loads of jobs for people all over Texas who want to support these bases. Because yeah, you've got people, men and women, being sent into Texas to be trained in these bases and some Texans themselves going to them to be trained. But all these bases need people to feed them, to build the barracks to run things like the laundry or whatever. These are jobs, lots and lots of jobs. And so what you have to remember is that this is after the end of, of the Great Depression. See, it is what ends the Great Depression, but it provides a lot of jobs to people who hadn't had great jobs, um, who hadn't had a lot of stability that way. And these are darn good paying jobs that are bringing in lots of people. So when you think of 109 air uh, bases that are being built around Texas, that's just little cities that are being established in all these different places that draw in farmers and people from all over the rural countryside into these new urban spaces. And that's what's going to really transform Texas more than anything else. But it's not just military bases. We also have a ton of POW camps. We have 21 POW camps all across Texas which housed mostly German soldiers. It, we also had some Italian soldiers and that was about it. We had a few um, smatterings of, of other Axis allies, but it was almost exclusively Germans and a few Italians. Why were they being sent to Texas? Because that's a great place to isolate somebody if they were captured in Northern Africa, all right? It's a part of Rommel's army out there. Can you imagine being a German in Hitler's army and suddenly you're in Bryan, Texas. Go ahead, run away. Where are you gonna go? Nowhere. <laughs> you are incredibly isolated, right? 
Every one of these POW camps means jobs, means opportunities for the people who live in the surrounding communities to help service and, 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 and make sure these places run smoothly, right? And there's more, all right? You guys have heard, I know, of the Japanese internment camps that were established in the United States that for the most part uh, in, uh, put into um, uh, detention camps, Japanese Americans, who in, in most cases were American citizens, uh, but were now considered suspect because of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the anti-Japanese sentiment that, uh, that was flamed out from there. Most of these people of Japanese ancestry in the United States lived along the West Coast. So from you know, Washington state down through Southern California and parts of Arizona. And the fear was that they would be the forward guard of another attack that Japanese zeros might bomb San Diego or Los Angeles or San Francisco or, or wherever. And so they were brought out of those places and then put in detention camps um, throughout the United States, mostly along the Plains region. And a lot of, not a lot, but several of them were in Texas, right? So we had several, you can see the stars down here like Crystal City, Fort Sam Houston, um, Kennedy, Texas, and, and so forth where EOW, uh, uh, Japanese people uh, were, were housed there. There weren't many Japanese Americans living in Texas. The 1940 census had like 458, I think, um, Japanese Americans in Texas. So these are mostly being brought out from outside the state into Texas. The reason it matters again, beyond the story of Japanese internment, which is important to understand and remember is these are like the POW camps, like the military bases. These are places that produce jobs for all kinds of Texans, all right? And this is what breaks the back of World War, or of the Great Depression, is all of these jobs that are available in these cities that Americans, Texans can go grab and build new lives for themselves that are good paying jobs in support of the war effort. Now this caused problems because all these Texans who are leaving the farms in rural America and moving to cities, there's not housing for that many people. Like these cities couldn't expand that quickly or that dramatically. And nobody had been building houses during the 1930s for all the obvious reasons. So suddenly during World War II, there's a massive housing shortage in Dallas, or Fort Worth, or Houston, or San Antonio, or Austin, or Waco, or any place else you can possibly imagine. Gainesville, Texas. Is a little bit north of where I am right now. They built a military base called Camp House. And suddenly nobody could get housing in Gainesville or where I live in Denton, Texas. So here's an article from uh, Denton Record Chronicle talking basically about the housing crisis and saying that they just they don't have enough houses. They don't have enough places for people to live. People are renting out rooms. They're renting out chicken coops. They're renting out the garage. They're, up, they're putting up like cardboard um, dividers in spaces like garages where you rent a cot in a corner because there's just nothing else available. So there are a lot of hardships that also come with this. That's again part of that sacrifice along with food rationing, gas rationing, all that sort of stuff that reminded people every day, day and night, that they're a part of this war effort and they're a part of this broader coalition that the United States is helping to lead in World War II. But here's the thing too, all of that was good for the Texas economy. And the Texas economy comes roaring back during World War II in a massive, almost overwhelming way. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of the military bases, but one of the big reasons is what you guys see right here, which is that when World War II hit, Texas had the largest known oil reserves in the world. You guys remember the very first session that we had back on like January 31st, it was talking about the road to 1930. One of the things we talked about is that um, during the 1920s and 1930 itself, Texas had struck some major oil uh, pockets and in the Permian Basin and East Texas, and we were producing 20% of the world's oil supply by the late 1920s. But all that had collapsed during the depression and nobody wanted any oil. World War II happens and suddenly demand for petroleum goes through the absolute roof. And Texas has the most proven known places in the entire world. We're the Saudi Arabia of World War II. So the United States, from, for military reasons, 
invests heavily in resurrecting the Texas oil industry, right? And one of the ways that they do that is they build these massive, and I just mean massive pipeline projects that bring Texas oil from East Texas up to places like New Jersey. So these guys right here, they're obviously not in Texas because you see the snow, but they're building this pipeline that becomes known as the Big Inch Pipeline, right? And the Big Inch Pipeline went here from Southeast Texas, um, near Beaumont, Port Arthur, places like that. And it went up all the way up to New Jersey, as you can see, right? I don't know why they call it the big inch because it was these, the pipes was actually, the pipes were, were two feet, 24 inches in diameter. So I, I don't know why they call it the big inch. Then they built a second pipeline called the little inch because, you know, that's an adorable name. And it went from East Texas near Longview, Kilgore. And it also went all the way up to, um, to New Jersey. The reason they're doing this is because almost all the refining capacity at this time in the United States is on the coast of New Jersey. And so it's not on the coast of Texas like it is today. Today, you go down to Port Arthur, or you go down near where San Jacinto is, and you see all this refining capacity. Same thing when you have Corpus Christi and places like that. None of that existed yet. So they have to get the oil up there. And they don't want to put it on ships in the Gulf of Mexico because they're afraid it'll get sunk by German U-boats which there were German U-boats patrolling in the Gulf of Mexico. So that was a real fear. So when the federal government invests in these massive pipelines, it's this gift to the Texas oil industry because it frees them in terms of production and being able to ship it very easily to refining, but also it increases demand dramatically, which brings Texas oil back online. It's like Oil goes from negative dollars a barrel to you know two hundred dollars a barrel virtually overnight, helping to resurrect the Texas economy. But wait, there's more. Okay, this is a, a late night infomercial, which I don't know if they still have late night infomercials because we live in the age of on demand and Netflix and all that sort of stuff. But back when I was growing up, late night infomercials were a staple of sleepovers. And there was always the but wait, there's more. Well, here the but wait, there's more is that there was even more jobs. There was even more opportunities for Texans. Building a war machine, like literally building the ships and the tanks and the planes and all those sorts of things, all right? Because the United States had to build not just uh, an army, not just a Navy and an Army Air Corps, they had to build the machinery that that would all work with. So there were shipyards built on the coast of Texas, all right? At Orange, Texas, for anybody who knows where Orange, Texas is, all right, right there on the coast. They established a naval shipyard. And when that happened, people flooded into Orange, Texas to get jobs. You can see right here, the population of Orange goes from 7,000 people to 33,000 after the installation of a military shipyard. Where are people coming from? Mostly rural Texas. Right? Some are coming from out of state. So the overall population of Texas actually does increase by several hundred thousand uh, I want to say it's half a million, actually, during World War II itself, as people are coming in from Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, to get some of these jobs, all right? But most of it's Texans, and they're abandoning rural life and rural farming and saying, I'm done with that. <laughs> I'm going to build ships, because it paid really well, all right? But it wasn't just ships either, all right? Texans built planes. So I'm up here in North Texas, I think some of you guys are too. And there were um, airplane manufacturing plants that were established outside of Fort Worth. In fact, there still are. And these factories were turned into these massive production plants for the, the, the air power that we would need to win World War II. And when you think about World War II, one of the keys, one of the biggest keys to the Allied success in World War II is that we just built this massive air force this massive air power it allowed us to carpet bomb Dresden and lots of Germany. It allowed us to succeed in the Pacific Ocean. It allowed us to take the nuclear weapons we developed and drop them on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, all that is only possible because we built all these planes. And so these, these factories opened up in places like Fort Worth and paid really good money for people who, who needed the jobs. And that was, uh, Fort Worth produced a lot of B-24s and a lot of cargo planes for the United States military that were used in combat or for moving troops and material uh, to the front lines, right? And so you see, see this picture here? Look at all those people, 
Those are jobs, baby. Jobs for all those folks. And they came in and there was actually a labor shortage, right? By the time World War II really gets going in 1942 and 43, which is a really big shift, right? Because during the depression, there was a massive labor surplus. There's too many people and not enough jobs. Then World War II hits and you ship out three quarters of a million Texans, mostly young men to fight on the front lines. Well, they're not there to do anything. They're not there to compete for jobs. And then you have all this industry coming in looking for anyone they can hire. And so there's a massive labor shortage all of a sudden during World War II, which means the economy booms, uh, wages go up, and the economy bursts out of, of uh, the doldrums that had been the situation during the Great Depression, which we talked all about, right? So you guys will appreciate the power of what this did to the Texas economy. So you can see right here, between 1939, Hitler invades Poland, and 1943, the Texas economy triples in size. That is a four-year period, people. Can you imagine if our modern economy tripled in size in four years? That'd be insane and slightly terrifying, I guess, in its own way. But what an economic boom that would be, right? That meant that the wages of most workers in Texas tripled during that time. So your income, and, and wouldn't this be glorious if this happened to all of us, all right? I wish this for all of you. you know, our, our income tripled. That would be amazing. That's what happened to Texans. During uh, the 1940s, the income of the average Texan triples, right? Even farmers who stay back on the farm, right, have their wages increased dramatically because there's this massive new demand for food, not just domestically, but to be shipped overseas in the Atlantic and the Pacific. So Texas farming income also goes up. Even farmers are doing well. But you know the economy is, is, is on all cylinders if even farmers are doing well. But the best marker in all this is that in 1944, right, the year before we win World War II, Texas is finally out of debt for the first time since 1933. Which is to say, it is World War II that finally breaks the back of the Depression. The New Deal had successfully gotten us a lot of the way out of the Depression, but we hadn't gotten all the way. And it's World War II that finishes that job, right? And then puts the economy, you know, running downhill at full speed for all the economic success we will experience during the 1950s, all right? But again, that means there's a lot of jobs and they need people to do those jobs. So who's gonna do <clears throat> all those jobs? My students usually have a good answer for this and it, it keys into one of the posters that, uh, one of the beautiful posters that Jay was showing you guys, right? But women, women were brought into the workforce um, in a very uh, positive patriotic kind of way. All right. Now, I don't know about y'all students. Mine will often say, well, women finally were allowed to work. And I always tell them, I was like, now, hold on now. Um, you got to remember, women have always worked all right, in all kinds of different ways. But even in industry, women have been working for a very long time. Um, poor women, working class women had always worked. All right. What's different during World War II is that the social expectations change. The idea was like, it's now a good thing if a woman works. Before World War II, women would work, but you really weren't supposed to. What you really were supposed to do is stay home with your kids while your husband worked. That was the ideal. And you know, some people had that ideal, but most did not. Um, during World War II, now we're saying like, no, no, no. The social expectation is that you will work, please, because it's your patriotic duty and we need it. We need you. We need Rosie the Riveter building and welding. And not just doing things that were considered um, women's work, as it was called at the time, like secretary work and things like that. We're talking about like riveting airplanes, right? Building ships in Orange, Texas. Jobs that have historically been seen as like brawn jobs that only men can do, but turned out women were very skilled and very capable of doing these jobs and did so very well. And so Texas women uh, volunteered for these positions in, in large numbers. A lot of them found it very exciting and empowering. And the fact that they were getting paid a really good wage was something that had a long-term effect on Texas women, as it did women across the United States, because they had earned this money that was their spending money, if they had any extra for what they needed for at home. Um, and they had the, you know, 
the, the, the positive experience of having a job that people admired and, and congratulated them for and all the good that comes from that, all right? This will also have a long-term effect beyond, um, beyond the war itself. There was also a massive need for farm labor because a lot of farmers in Texas had abandoned the farms to go make airplanes or ships. Um, and there was such need for food that as Texas farmers who stayed on the farm ramped up production, they needed people to help pick and process food. The problem was they didn't have anybody. Um, if you guys remember when we talked about the depression two weeks ago, um, Texas had actually deported about a quarter million Mexicans, ethnic Mexicans to Mexico because they were trying to get rid of people that they thought were competing for jobs. Now suddenly they need more people. And so the United States um, goes out looking for more people to work. And the United States approached Mexico during this period. And they said to Mexico, listen, we need workers. You have people who would like jobs. And we'd like to start a program that would be a job worker program that would bring Mexicans into the United States to work on farms. And they'd give them a work visa. And they weren't allowed to become citizens necessarily, but they had a work visa to come work in the United States and then eventually go back to Mexico. It'd be good for the United States because they get labor. It'd be good for the Mexican nationals who came because they have jobs. And it was called the Bracero program. And so they, the United States approached Mexico with this offer. And Mexico said, yeah, you know, that sounds good. I think, I think we'll go for that. And then Mexico said, but there's just one catch. There's one state in the United States that we just don't trust to treat Mexicans well. There's just one state that has this history that makes us feel a little eh, not comfortable that we'd like excluded from the Bracero program. There are you guys to guess what state that was, right? Da -da -da. It's Texas, right? And the reason is that Mexico recognizes that uh, Mexicans and Mexican Americans have not been treated as equals in Texas up through the 1940s. And this sign that uh, is very Art Deco um, is a good example of what you would have seen in Texas. Right? So Mexico is reacting to that. And so Mexico actually excludes Texas from the Bracero program. Texas leaders in San, in San Antonio in Austin get so upset about this that they actually try to convince Mexico to let them um, have braceros come into Texas. And so the state legislature, and I am not making this up, passes something called the Caucasian Race Resolution in 1943 to try to convince Mexico that it'll be okay to send their people to Texas. And what the Caucasian Race Resolution said was, don't worry, we'll treat Mexicans as though they're white. You can trust us. Um, Mexico did not trust them. And Texas was excluded from the Bracero program through the rest of World War II and when the program continued after World War II up until 1947, right? So it was a big success in the United States, but this is one place where Texas's history caught up with it and it was excluded, right? But in the end, uh, by the time you get to 1945, it's the, it's the aggregate combination of all of those different pieces that absolutely remakes Texas. All right, so these guys here are reading newspapers um, in what would have been May 1945. So Hitler kills himself on April 30th. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Germany uh, surrenders on May 8th, 1945. So I, I imagine this is um, May 8th, 1945. You can imagine the, the euphoria of that, right? The rest of the summer of 45 is spent in the fight in the Pacific, um, and then we drop the atomic bombs, both of them, on Japan in August of 1945, and Japan will surrender in September of 1945, which brings the war to an end. And so when Texas soldiers, like these, these folks right here, come back to Texas in 1945, they find a very different state than when they left, right? Um, Texans live in cities now, and Texans have jobs they didn't have before, industries we didn't have before, income that didn't exist before, right? We need to build, we need to build housing for these people. We need to expand cities for these people. There's a fear that things might go back to where they were during the Depression. But the reality is Texas will be profoundly, deeply, and forever changed by the experience, not just of World War II, but of the Depression and the New Deal and World War II combined. All right. 
And so we're going to talk next week, our last week, about what those pieces were and how they tied into a different Texas, but also how they, they, they were a springboard for the emergence of the civil rights movement of the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s that will not just change Texas, but will change the entire United States, which will also be centered in Texas. We'll talk about that. With that, I'm going to pause and I'm going to hand the mic over to my friend and colleague, Michelle, who's going to give you guys a couple of resources. All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, first of all, I just want to say how stinking amazing Jay's stuff was. That was super awesome. I'm like super pumped to use them in my own classroom. So good job, Jay. Um, and really good perspective um, from the woman's point of view. I think I'm I'm super excited about all of that. Um, all right, so m my stuff focuses on um, the World War II on the home front. Um, and it starts out with a with a hook exercise, just like we always do. This hook exercise is all about propaganda. Um, just like Jay said, I'm going to echo that. My and and you guys will echo this as well. My students love propaganda. I love propaganda. I love to look at it. I love to analyze it, um, and I love to use it in my classroom because there's there's really no better resource, especially during the World War eras, uh, to teach with. And so. Um, what I put here were just are just three different pieces of propaganda, three different posters. Um, they're all advertising something different. The first one is war bonds. Second one is um, recycling, and the third one is is um, urging people to stay home, conserve gas mostly. Um, that's why they're urging people to stay home. And so I've got some analysis questions down here that would. Uh, um, for what I've got next. I'm going to give you, show you guys what I've got next. Um, since there was such a big talk about simulations, I created one specifically for rationing during World War II because this is what super affected the home front, right? This is what affected everybody um, in the United States, but this is really more specific to Texas, the, the simulation. Um, I created one mostly because there are several others out there, but the other ones take several days. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have several days to spend on a World War II simu simulation. This is like crunch time um, for Texas history teachers. And so um, this World War II simulation should be uh, complete in, in a day. Like I teach 45 minute classes and that means I have about 30 minutes of instruction time um, when it's all said and done. And so I created this one to be short and sweet, and hopefully you'll be able to get through it in one day. Um, I'm going to run through exactly what I've got, just so you guys are clear on on what's going on here. And I, I was oh, Andrew, gonna, is there something wrong? No, I was just going to say, um, uh -huh. I don't know if Jay was able to share the link. I don't have the link myself. Oh, we could sure, I can share chat. it right now. Okay, just want to make sure everyone's got Very it. Very sorry. That was fine. Give me, oops, not that one. You guys get to watch as I share it. Give me one second. <laughs> Ah, here we go. All right, I'll, I'll drop it in the chat for you guys so that you can follow along. Uh, if I can find the chat, one second. Oh, there it is. There you go. Okay. Uh, Let's see, back to the World War II rationing simula simulation. Okay, so uh, I started out with all the propaganda, just uh, just like they took a look at uh, in the in the uh, hook exercise, um, and then the second before I before I move on uh, slide by slide, I want to show you this slide one through uh, seven is like a is like a teacher presentation or it can be used as a student uh, individual presentation. They can go through this themselves. However, um, I, I have sectioned it off like that so that the information part is obviously front loaded in the, in the first part of this. And then the simulation is saved for the last part. So um, I wanted to preface that. Um, there's a little introduction part uh, with a little bit of reading. Um, some very basic instructions. Uh, and then there's a video in here because I, I, my students learn very well from the quick short videos um, that I can include. So I included that video for you guys. Um, and then there's just 
some information about rationing, like what it is, what was the sugar that Andrew mentioned was rationed first. Um, and then here's a fantastic nutrition guide um, that they can analyze. Uh, moving on to the Victory Gardens. And then I've got some really great images of the war ration books and what they look like uh, and the stamps themselves. Um, and then the very last piece of that is uh, the, the rationing information inside of the, um, inside of the newspaper. Um, I sectioned the two pieces off with the teacher instructions just so that you guys can have a visual and know where to stop. Um, and then beyond the teacher instructions, uh, this is where the, uh, the actual simulation starts. You can do it one of two ways. Um, in my classroom, I think I would probably print it out just so the students can interact with the material a little bit better. I would not print the first part of this uh, sim simulation out, uh, the, the information that I just showed you, but I would print the student documents out because um, there's really something to be said about students interacting with, the, with paper copies. Um, students are given step-by-step -step instructions just, just as you see here. Um, and that's where it comes in a little bit more handy to print things, um, especially for my, my lower learners. Uh, and then I created a, a war ration book just for them. They can fill it out with their names, uh, their street number, their addresses, age, all of that kind of information. Um, it, I, I made it to replicate um, the war ration books that were given by the government during World War II. So hopefully they look very similar. The instructions on, on slide number 11, that comes straight out of a war rationing book. So you, you might want to preface that with your students um, that, that this information comes straight out of a war ration book. So this is theirs to take a look at and analyze, but not necessarily um, go, go specific. It does not necessarily give them um, instructions for the uh, simulation. Um, moving on, here's, here's what uh, the students are tasked to do. They're tasked to choose four of their favorite recipes um, from the wartime recipes. They all look, they all actually remind me of my grandmother's recipes. I, many of you probably have grandparents who lived here, uh, through World War I, World War II era, um, Great Depression and, and rationing times. And so I, I, as I was looking through these, I was like, I'm pretty positive my grandmother made those potato waffles. <laughs> um, anyways. They, they pick four of these, uh, and then what they do with those is create a grocery list. Um, they're going to write everything down on the grocery list. It reminds them that they have $2.50 in cash to spend. And then uh, here's how they're going to find their points. They roll a dice uh, to figure out which month or which scenario they're given. Uh, based on the number of, on the dice, that's, that's the number of points that they'll add up. Um, so, for example, January says these stamps, the stamps that are va valid for January are A, B, and only in the values of one, two, and eight. Um, and here is their little stamp booklet um, that they can, they can circle or highlight the stamps or however you want to instruct them to do that. Um, any of those ways will work. Um, so then they're going to have their point value. Um, that they can add up here to the grocery list. Uh, and then they've also got um, a price and point list with these. These are just basic ingredients, but these are all the ingredients combined from all, all six of the recipes. Um, they're all on here. They've all got a point value and a price. Um, and all of those point values and prices are relevant to the point values and prices that were given to, to items like this um, in Texas, uh, well, in the United States. Um, there's, there's all of the lists. Um, and once they figure out, uh, once they get all that charted and figure out the price for each, each thing and, and the point value for each item, um, then they can total all of those up and, uh, figure out if they have enough money or if they don't have enough money or if they have enough points, um, because they have to have enough money and enough points to be able to purchase things. Um, and then there's, just a couple of re uh, reflection questions at the very end so that it can kind of like help them sum up the entire process and, and write down um, exactly what they experienced during the simulation. 
And the very last piece of this is the exit ticket. And it goes, it goes along with the simulation as well. Um, these are just additional reflection pieces. What challenges did they encounter? Um, and then it, and it, it, it encourages them to think a little bit deeper about the citizens who actually experienced um, these rationing situations. So that is all I've got for you guys. I'm going to uh, stop right there.